you always need a light um, beer, especially when you're mixing it with cereal. If you recall from college days, right. we always wanted Captain Crunch peanut butter right, with like a nice light Schmidt or Coors beer oh. to give you that flavor. I don't know if Guinness. Heineken? Uh, maybe a Heine. <laughs> maybe you can put your Heine in with your uh, with your Lucky Charms, Tim, but I wouldn't try anything else. No? No. All right. Thicker beer is just blech, with uh, huh. the sweetness. It just offsets. The uh, malt and the uh... hops. Yeah. People think I'm kidding, but in college, Tim and I used to yeah. eat. You used to eat uh, Captain Crunch peanut butter, cartoon cereal, cocktails with uh, with uh, beer, Schmidt beer usually because yeah. that's what we had left over in the keg. Yeah, that's all and, there was, and that's what we would uh, have breakfast because we didn't have milk. We were college students. Well, yeah, who I had mean, money for milk when you have a keg of beer in the fridge? That's right. Yeah. So that's uh, well, happy St. Patrick's Day to all of you. Thank you for tuning in. All right, here's some exciting news. Back again Monday, Tim. Mm-hmm. Slogging through supernatural news and parish share stories. Right. 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 And here's the deal for now on. If you're interested and you'd like to be a part of Parashare and you're available Sundays between about 1230 and 1.30 or maybe even like 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock central time, mm-hmm. just email me with your phone number and a brief synopsis of what your story covers. And uh, we may call you one Sunday that, uh, you know, to involve you in this as we pre-record, of course, the show. Yeah. Uh, but then we can call you and have you share your story with us. So if yeah. you're interested for this Sunday to be a part of the show and you have a Parashare story you've been waiting to tell us, waiting to share with us, then all you have to do is uh, email me and uh, Dave at DarknessRadio.com and be available this Sunday between about 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock. And we'll give you a call and you can tell your story. We'll record it and have it as a part of the show on Monday. We're trying to work around because I know people like to hear from the listeners as well. Yep. So we're trying to do that and see if we can work out. Tuesday, Tim, I'm pretty excited. Yeah. People have been asking. Yeah. People have been begging. Uh huh. And we finally have an opportunity. Well, That's this, right. This is it. This is it. This Tuesday, is it? we're back with the triumphant return of True Crime Tuesday. It's a one off, but it's a, sh- a show called Possessed The Stiletto Murders. So oh. it's it's got true crime and a supernatural element. So that's how we're sneaking that back into the lineup this right. Tuesday. But I'll tell you what, folks, hear me now. Believe me later. The more of you that listen and download that show immediately, the better there is a chance of us getting more episodes of True Crime Tuesday to return. Don't email them, though. I found out they don't like that. Yeah, yeah <laughs> they, don't do that. That got us the, the gig to five days a week. But if you continue to email them begging, it just irritates people. So don't email them anymore. For um, True Crime Tuesday. Mm-hmm. Let's just uh, let this organically build. Make sure you listen next Tuesday when we do a special edition of Darkness Radio Beyond the Darkness True Crime Tuesday, a true crime show embedded with a little bit of paranormal activity. So that'll keep you in it. Plus, yes, we will visit dumb crimes and stupid criminals. Florida man, oh, you've been busy in the month, two, three months that we haven't spoken to you, but we will bring him back in a triumphant <laughs> return, Tim. He's he's been a part of many stories. So we'll do uh, True Crime Tuesday with a case of possession, the stiletto murders, and then of course we'll regale you with tales from Florida and around the world of dumb crimes and stupid criminals. That's the beginning of next week. Pretty exciting, huh? Very exciting. Very cool. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get into tonight's show as we wrap up yet another week, Tim. It's Friday, and it's time for a call from heaven. Deathbed oh. visits, angelic visions, and crossings to the other side. Our guest is Josie Varga. She is the author of several books. She's been called an angel who's taken human form, a former magazine editor and communications consultant. Her life changed course when she received a validated dream message from a man who died in September 11th attacks on the World Trade Center. Forever transformed by this experience, she embarked on a spiritual journey as she vowed to help others understand that life truly never ends and love never dies. Life, she says, is eternal, and so are we. She's here to share her insights and information from her book, A Call from Heaven. Josie, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, Thank you so much for having me, Dave. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. All right, uh, talk to us a little bit about your background. Um, Have you always been sensitive? You know, I get that question a lot. Um, The way it first happened, I didn't, like, jump into this field head first. Most people who get into paranormal research, and I, I understand that that's how you began your research, or right. you saw the spirit of your grandmothers. Is that correct when you were a child? Yes, that's right. Okay. Well, that's kind of what happened with me. Um, I You saw my of- grandmother too? <laughs> <laughs> In a dream, but not oh, uh, gotcha. as an apparition. But okay. what, I, what I mean to say is, 
what happened with me is I had a vivid dream of my husband's friend who died in the World Trade Center attacks. But the thing is, I never, ever met him when he was on this earth. So I have this dream about him. I'm walking down this long hallway. I come to this room at the end. I walk in. I see desk and windows everywhere. I look up. I see my husband's friend. Okay. His name is Rich. And he says to me, Josie, thank you for mentioning me in your book. And when I say he said that, Dave, I mean telepathically. Okay. There were no words. It was just mind to mind communication. And what he meant by that is my first book, Footprints in the Sand, was just about to be released. And I had mentioned him in the epilogue of the book. He talked about the importance of life and how East Wasted Minute was a crime and things like that. I thought it was, you know, very popular and very powerful, and I included it in the book. So in this dream, I see him, and like I said, never met him, but yet I knew it was him. And he says, thank you for mentioning me in your book. And for whatever reason, Dave, my first words to him were, you have to prove to me that this is really you, okay? And when I said that, he picked up a cell phone. It was like one of those flip phones at the time. And he showed me a picture of him, his wife, and his son. And he said, Josie, he said, Boston is okay. Okay? He said, Boston is okay. Now, I had no idea what that meant at the time. Mm -hmm. but, I, but I understood, though, that this was a message that I needed to get to his wife. So the next thing I know, I kind of see myself on the street. And I look out and I see him in what looked like the bed of a pickup truck. And he's standing behind his wife and son. And he looks at me and he says, okay, you know, give them the message. And sort of kind of pushes me forward, all right? And when he did that, I woke up sitting up, okay, in a sitting position, panting and out of breath, feeling like something hit me in my chest. I was so scared. Nothing like that had ever happened before. And the first thing I did was I ran to the phone to call my husband, who was already at work. And I said to him, oh, my God, you're not going to believe what just happened. You know, Rich came to me in a dream. You have to tell his wife that Boston is okay. And how do you think he reacted? <laughs> He's, he acted like I was off my rocker. You're crazy. I'm not doing this. You just lost right. your husband. You know, that kind of thing. So we compromised. And what we did is I sent him an email describing what happened. He forwarded that email to Rich, his sister-in-law, okay, because they worked in the same field, so he had her email address. And about two weeks later, we get an email from the sister-in-law, and she, to make a very long story short, when he said to me, Boston is okay, the reason he said that is because his wife was considering selling her home and moving to Boston. She had a brother who lived in Boston, so she considered selling her home and taking her son to Boston. But she felt guilty because she purchased a house right before her husband died. So that's what she meant, and what he meant when he said, Boston is okay. So can you imagine my shock? Because I never met this man. Uh, but yet, I have to tell you, I knew what I experienced was real. So even though when my husband told me when he sent that email, he was like, oh my God, I should never have did that. I wish I could retract it. But I didn't feel that way at all because I knew I did what I was supposed to do. So that whole experience um, changed my life because I realized that somebody who was deceased gave me a message for his wife that was later validated. And the way it all started with all of my books, mm -hmm. um, I started researching the phenomena, but not to write a book, Dave. When I first started researching it, it was for me. You know, I wanted to know that I wasn't going crazy. And once I started researching everything, I realized, oh, my God. I'm not alone. And so many other people uh, around the world had the same experience. So much, in fact, that I've started to write a book about it. And that's how Visits from Heaven came into being, and which led to the rest of my books. That's great. I mean, what an amazing opportunity. But I mean, how powerful is it when you get a message, especially regarding uh, such a tragedy, a tragedy like 9-11? Um, yeah. Does that really kind of make you just stand back in awe of this unseen world around us? You know, I, I tell you what, it, it was really, like, at first when it happened to me, I said to myself, why me? You know what I mean? Because right. I, kind of, I kind of felt, like, guilty in a sense, if that makes any sense at all, because why did he come to me? Why didn't he go to his wife? Okay, why didn't he go directly to his wife and say Boston is okay? Why didn't he just say his wife's name is Karen? Okay, 
So why didn't he go directly to Karen and say, mm -hmm. hey, Karen, it's okay. You can take the baby. You can move to Boston. And I'll tell you why. There's, that particular sign is called a third-party sign. And third-party signs are more validating because I'm an outside party. I had no knowledge of this whatsoever. In fact, I never even met him or his family. So his wife getting that message from me is far more validating. If she were to have a dream of her husband, okay, she might have second guessed it. She might have said, okay, right. I'm, you know, I'm feeling guilty about selling the house and moving. So that's why I had this dream. Do you know what I mean? Right. No, I, I totally get that. Yeah. So that's how it all started. And uh, visits to heaven led, I mean, visits from heaven led to visits to heaven, which is about near death experiences. And then from there, I wrote a book called Divine Visits, which is about angelic and divine encounters. Um, and now my latest book, A Call from Heaven, uh, which is about deathbed phenomena. All right. Talk to yeah. us a little bit about that for, for new people coming to the show that might not be familiar with that. What is and what constitutes a deathbed visit? A deathbed visit is an experience that someone may have on their deathbed. What does that mean? It, it could be, um, you know, being visited by an angelic being. It could be Jesus. It could be Mary. It could be angels. It could be a deceased relative, or, you know, a deceased friend. In fact, most of the people that experience these phenomena are met by family members. It's not, you know, mostly uh, angelic beings. Most people report being met by, you know, like a mother or a sister or a deceased relative, which kind of makes sense um, because, you know, your mother is the first person that sees you when you're born, and it makes sense that a mother figure will be there when you die. Um, David Kessler uh, wrote a book, and he said that. He said in his research... He found that most people reported being met by a motherly figure. Um, I'll tell you, though, the most amazing thing for me with this book are uh, experiences uh, that are known as peak endowing experiences. And what that means is um, a woman by the name of, I think it's Frances Cobb, uh, she wrote a book in 1882, and she wrote back then, about these deathbed phenomena. And the reason she called it Peak and Darien, it was, a, it was by a poem by John Keats, and he talks about the Spaniards in Panama, and they go over this cliff, Dave, and they expect to see land, but instead of seeing land, they see water. So they're shocked, right? And that's why she called the book Peak and Darien Experiences. But what's incredible about these experiences is people on their deathbed are met by people that are actually dead, that they didn't, but they had no knowledge of their death. There's a story, uh, his name is um, Eddie Cuomo, and this was reported by Bruce Grayson in a study that he did. So Eddie Cuomo has a very high fever, right? And he goes into a coma. He comes out of the coma and he says to his father, oh, dad, I was met by, you know, his deceased aunt, his deceased uncle. And then all of a sudden he says to his father, and Teresa was there too, but Teresa told me that it wasn't my time. Teresa told me that I had to go back. So his father gets really upset because Teresa was the name of his sister and Teresa was away at college. So the father says, what do you mean? The kid's name was Eddie. So he says, what do you mean, Eddie? Your sister is away at college. I just spoke to her two days ago. And he becomes very upset. And the son insists, no, dad, I saw her. She told me that it wasn't my time and I had to go back. Well, the father goes home and he gets a message from the college. His daughter died in a car accident just after midnight, but he wasn't told yet, so he didn't know. So, that, so how wow. do you explain something like that? Yeah, you know, no, yeah I, that's the tough stuff. I, I mean, it's, it's an amazing account and it's a great story. And how do you discount that there's something? Yet there are people like myself who... You know, I've been doing this for 12 years and I've had experiences with ghosts throughout my life, Josie, but I still have this overwhelming fear that at the end of it all, it's just a candle in the wind. And once it goes out, it's done. Really? You still feel that way? I, I'm afraid. And I know people write to me every time I mention that and they're like, well, you have to have faith in God and Christ and blah, blah, blah. I have faith, <laughs> but it doesn't take away fear. Listen, I know that snakes bite. I know if you avoid snakes, they won't bite you, but it doesn't mean I stopped fearing snakes. It just means that I'm, you know, cautious of them, but I'm still terrified beyond comprehension of them. 
the idea of death freaks me out. Some of these stories bring some peace and comfort to me. But, mm-hmm. I, you know, on the skeptical side, which a lot of people forget, I'm also a skeptical believer. I That's also, yeah, right. Yeah. I, but I, I understand that the brain sometimes handles things differently and handles, you know, is it the idea that a loved one comes to mind as we're dying, a, a dead loved one, and they're, we're so afraid of going that that visage of the dead loved one starts to tell us don't go when it's really our own personality, our own image that's telling us this. It's just taking on a different look. Um, well, let me ask you something. Sure. You you said that you saw the spirit of your grandmother or mm-hmm. whatever. What exactly happened? You having, know, I don't, I don't know. Having that experience I, didn't change how you feel about death? I, I was like two and a half years old, three years old at the time. So I have no physical memory of this. I just remember the stories my mom and aunt would share with me. So if it had uh, ended there, okay. I would leave it be. I, I've had um, visitation. I've had a dream visitation from my grandfather. But again, knowing my overwhelming fear of death and and everything and, and the way the brain works to cope with grief, even though I had the experience and it was profound and it was deeply touching, I, I'm still left with the concern of, is this just my brain's way of processing what occurred? So that I can move on with my own life because I'm I'm not letting go. And there was a shared experience, which I, I've mentioned and I'll briefly mention to you is, you know, after I had this dream visitation and it was over and my grandfather and I had this beautiful conversation and he let me in on some of the secrets of death and, and heaven. As he faded away, I sat up in my bed and I could see his face fade into the darkness. My girlfriend woke up and rolled over and said, go shut the closet door. I can smell your grandfather's clothes. Ah, because the door, okay. you know, I'd, I'd saved a bunch of his outfits after he passed away. And, and not that my grandfather stunk, but, you know, uh, grandpas have a, <laughs> have a smell to them and cologne and 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 all of that. And, and he had some of his clothes in my closet that still smelled very much like my grandfather. And I looked to the closet door thinking maybe that was it. Maybe I had a dream and I could smell it was a hot, sticky night. Maybe the smell had gotten to me and um, it just entered into my dream. But I looked and the closet door was shut. And it was gone. The smell was gone, but she could smell it. And my grandfather had visited. Again, I'd like to believe that these are true signs from the other side. And that's what fascinates me about these stories. And I'd love to hear more because it does bring me some level of contentment. Now, Tim, let me ask you, as as somebody who's had visitations Mm -hmm. prior to and leading up right after death from loved ones, Mm -hmm. does that bring you peace that there is something beyond our lifetime or are you still left with as many questions as you had before? I feel a little more uh, secure. You yeah, do? I do. I, I, I do feel more secure. I think more so than than I did maybe even, uh, I'd say, 15, 20 years ago. Um, uh, in, in that first visitation I had was in my mid-20s. Mm-hmm. Um, in that, I, the, the first visitation really took me aback. The second visitation, not so much. Um but in that before that, I, I really was was having kind of the same experience as you were, where I would I would stay awake at night, worried that there was nothing there, that, that I mean, terrifying anxiety that there was nothing there, mm-hmm. like almost want to grab your heart, feeling like your heart was tightening up, right. type of anxiety. Um, and with the visitations, it, it it did make me feel a little bit better. There there did feel like there was something tangible, something very real to it, and that did bring me some comfort. Yeah. Josie, why do you think, you know, I mean, we have these experiences and I had, as I said, I had my grandmother visited me, my -hmm. grandfather visited me. I've, I've grown up in what I believe to be a very haunted house. You know, I lost my mother this past November and I, there's, there's nobody, I I was never closer to anybody than I was to my mother, but my mother hasn't visited me. I haven't seen her, heard from her, not in dream form, not in waking form. Mm -hmm. And she had always said, don't worry, honey, I'll let you know. And, you know, I'll, I'll assure you that, that there's something later and she hasn't. And that's a scary as shit moment, because if anybody was going to do it, it would have been my mom to come through. Now, I didn't have any pre-planned programs with my grandfather and grandmother. Um, you know, that wasn't put into play. Uh, I've, I've had mediums reach out to me that say, hey, I have a message from your mother. And I have a hard time because these mediums were also friends of my mother. So it's really hard for me to validate if they're truly getting a message or they see my posts showing my grieving process and they're trying to comfort me. So, Mm -hmm. you know, when we look at the idea of deathbed visits and angelic visions and and crossing over, it leaves me just in as dark a place because I can't say that the person I was closest to has come to me to to 
give me any peace on the subject. But, but you know how I, I hear that all the time. Like the hardest part of what I do is when somebody, let's say a mother who has lost a child and they come to me and say, you know, why? And, and how come, how, you know, why hasn't my child visited me? And a lot of times, Dave, it's because grief gets in the way. Um, they say that, you know, it's hard for those on the other side to come through to us when we are grieving and sometimes we don't see the signs and you also have to remember you said your mother just died um in november right that's not a long time the it, on the other side there is no time as we know it here okay so maybe your mother just you know has tried to come through to you and you haven't seen the signs and you know maybe it's just not the right time yet you know they say that they come through to us when we need it most but they also say that sometimes, you know, grief gets in the way. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, and I know that's, I know that's hard for you. You know, I know if I lost my, my mother is still here, but if I lost my mother and I was, and I really, really wanted to hear from her and I didn't hear from her, that, that would, that would be devastating to me. And one of the things that people ask me all the time, you know, Josie, knowing what you know, you know, um, is it easier for you when you lose a loved one? Okay. And my answer, Dave, is always the same. Yes, it's easier, but it's not easy. It's still hard. It sucks, okay? Right. It, and I see it, that's kind of how I feel yeah. about it is I've, I've investigated enough claims. I've been in haunted places where I know something is going on and it, it's not visual and it seems to be something from our past, but I, I'm not brought any comfort by any of this. It just it, it leaves me unnerved. Now, did you ever have a near-death experience yourself? No, I've never had a no death experience. Um, the way it started for me was the visit from my husband's friend. And people say to me, well, you know, did you believe in the afterlife before that? And yes, I did. Um, but I, the way I describe it is, yeah, I believed in the afterlife, but now I know. I mean, to me, I mean, I know it's different for you, but for me, after having that experience, it was like a knowing beyond knowing because first of all, I, I'd never met him while he was on this earth. I only saw a picture of him. Yet when I saw him in my experience, I knew it was him. I had no knowledge of Boston, Dave, whatsoever. And his, his wife could certainly vouch for me there. I had no knowledge of Boston mm-hmm. whatsoever. So how can I possibly make something like that up? Right. You know, where, where did that information come from? And in fact, I recently, after all this time, I never met his wife in person. And when it first happened, I was actually afraid to approach his wife because, you know, you don't know how they're going to react. You don't know if they believe in this or or what, you know, even though I strongly believed in it, I didn't know how his wife would react. So I met her recently. She invited me to a play that her son was in. And she told me, she said, "Um, you know, I totally believe. So then I saw her sister, who the one that John, my husband John, sent the email to. And she said, I, I found it so odd and I was so shocked by your email. I didn't know how to explain it. And I said to her, well, how do you think, you know, how do you think I feel? Mm-hmm. So it, it wasn't easy for me to go public with all of this. Um, when it first happened, I was scared and I thought, OK, you know, people are going to think I'm crazy. And then I realized, but wait a minute, you know, I've really been given a gift because truthfully, I'm not afraid to die anymore. I'm really not. Uh, I say I'm afraid of how I'm going to die, you know, like I I don't want to be hit by a bus or something like that, (laughs) you know, so I'm afraid of how I'm going to die. But am I afraid of dying? No, because in, in my mind, that's not really going to happen. I mean, yes, we die. You know, the body dies, you know. I mean, your your mother might not be around physically, but she's definitely around spiritually, you know? And sure. have you ever um, tried asking her for a specific sign, you know? Um, yeah, see, this is where I, I start. And I know there's going to be listeners I piss off with this. And Tim and I <laughs> talk about these debates as well. But it's something, you know, sometimes you, you learn too much and you become dangerous, too. Um, you know, I know what mnemonic triggers are. I understand that when you're, you know, our brain is trying to make sense of, anarchy and of the world around us. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't believe that a song popping up on the radio is a message for my mom. It's a, it's a song on a radio. I'm listening to the, no, if I'm sitting in the car and the radio's off and it turns on 
and suddenly I hear cat's cradle and then it yep. turns off afterwards. Okay, to me that's a that's a sign. But if I'm sitting in the car and a song pops on that I know my mom'd like, that doesn't mean to me that mom made the DJ play that song. You know, that that doesn't occur to me. I you know, my my grandfather smoked a special brand of cigarettes. And if I am thinking about him that day and I look over and I see that package of cigarettes, a lot of people think, oh, it's a sign. I never see lucky strikes, but there they are. And it's a sign from from heaven or God or my or my grandfather. And I don't think that I just think I'm more hyper aware right now than ever of my grandfather. And I'm thinking of him and I'm remembering things and I see a package of lucky strikes and it it reignites an image of my grandfather. I don't believe it's a sign from the other side. People find pennies all the time and. And it's a sign and a dime. It's a sign. And I think, holy shit, are you easy to manipulate? This is, <laughs> That's not a sign. It's a flipping penny. They're all over. You know, yeah, now, not, not, you see, but some pennies are signs. Uh, not all pennies, though. Um, you know, like uh, people get so caught up mm-hmm. sometimes, uh, you know, the, the, you know, to believe they're upset. Um, they all want right. to get a sign so bad that they think everything is a sign. And, you know, that's that, like you said, that's dangerous. Um, I'll, I'll give you an, uh, let's see. Well, what you not, think I wouldn't this. say dangerous. Okay. I, I don't want to be going on and saying it's dangerous. If that's what people need and that will comfort them, then God love them. And I hope that they find right. the comfort in that to me. I, you know, and, and then it's hard because I've sat there second guessing what kind of message, what sign do I want for my mom that would prove to me that it wasn't just an after effect of my own ego or id putting it out to the universe and now just noticing it because I was asking for it. What would be enough for me to say, that's my mom. That is my mom. It's not going to be a butterfly that lands on my shoulder because I've been hundreds of places where butterflies just land on me. Um, right. You know, I, I've I've had white doves show up and, and sit on me. It doesn't mean that Prince is visiting me. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's just that I'm, I'm I just am in the right place at the right time. But that, that's when you ask for a sign. I don't know how to specifically do it and not feel like I'm tainting the experience myself. I just figured it'll happen if it's supposed to happen and mom will make herself known. And that's why I'm trying not to even rely as much as I would love to speak to a medium and get the message from my mom. I just right now, the only mediums I know and the ones that I love and trust knew and love and trusted my mom. And it's, it's an impossible task to go outside of that realm and ask somebody else to do a reading because uh, you know, my mom, if anybody I think would come to, she'd come to one of these special friends of ours. And on the other hand, she'd know that I would have a hard time discerning that as a real message because of who they are. So that's that's where I stick. But I, I don't think it's dangerous to ask for uh, it. And if it comforts people, I'm all for it. But uh, go ahead. I, I didn't mean to interrupt your no, story, but I just wanted I, to point that uh, out. Let me give you an example. So mm-hmm. um, the one it was my birthday on this particular day. And I had asked my godmother who passed away in 2010, in February 2010, for a sign. Um, so on, on that day, I went shopping with my mother and my mother and my godmother were very mm-hmm. good friends. And on the way into the store, my mother noticed a penny. I bent down to pick it up and it was a 1965 penny, which was the year that I was, um, you know, born. So I said, Hmm. Now I specifically asked my godmother for a sign with coins. So, Okay. All right, on the way back out of the store, we're again walking across to the car. We see another one. What year is it? 2010, the year that my godmother passed away. Mm. Now, to me, that was just amazing. And then how do you, you know, you could chalk it up and say, oh, it's a coincidence, you know, but the, the fact that I specifically asked her for a sign and I got two coins, the year of my birth and the year of her death, I thought that's, that was pretty amazing. No, that's and that is. See, I guess what I would want, my grandfather and I used to collect wheat pennies. You know, I guess what I'd want is my grandfather to fling a wheat penny and hit me between the eyes. That would impress me. You know, that that's what I'm asking yeah. for. And it's hard yeah. to do. I'll tell you what, let's cover more of these stories that you put in the book. I want to hear uh, a variety of, of documented deathbed visits from around the world that you put in this book and hear some of the other insights you have to share. But right now, ladies and gentlemen, close your eyes, go to the light, follow the sound of my voice. As we enter the dark hives for another true tale in theater of the mind to hell and back by Dan Schwartz. After a life of parochial schooling, I had a falling out with religion, church and my faith. It no longer suited me and I found it silly and nothing more than old superstitions cobbled together as a money making scheme for churches. I never considered myself a bad person, certainly no worse than anyone else I knew. 
Like many, I was often selfish and not nearly as neighborly or caring as I could be. I had moved into my neighborhood when I was 27 and never once had a word with any of my neighbors besides a simple nod of the head in passing. Then, everything I knew changed on a summer day, a few months after I turned 45. I was out mowing my lawn when I felt my stomach start to sour. A strange sensation in my chest, and I immediately regretted that gas station burritos I had scarfed down for lunch. The heat was getting to me, and I cut off the lawnmower to take a sip of water. Then it hit me like a thunderous punch from Mike Tyson, square in the chest. My mouth dropped open into a silent scream, and my vision began to flicker. I could hear the sounds of the neighborhood, kids playing, dogs barking, people mowing their own lawns. Then it was silent. All I could hear was the offbeat rhythm of my own heartbeat, pulsing in my ears, throbbing, throbbing, throbbing. Then the lights went out, and I collapsed. I remember feeling like I was laying on my parents' water bend when I was a child. Then slowly, light started to flicker once more, and I could hear voices. Oh, oh, he's here. Finally, he's here. Then I could see bright light, and set against it was the stark silhouettes of people. Voices sounded familiar but distant, calling my name. I began to feel lighter, floating, and my vision slowly began to return to me. And I could see a mass of people smiling, waving. Some appeared to be crying. And when I realized that, I... I began to feel a sense of dread and fear come over me. Their smiling faces gave way to somber looks. I felt like I was in a large freight elevator looking out at the crowd, and then the bottom dropped out. And I heard what I thought was my mother sobbing as I fell, through the darkness, terror growing inside me. I, I was so confused, so scared. I fell for what felt like ten minutes. Just imagine, the scariest drop from the roller coaster you've ever been on, only it kept going and going and going. Then my body stopped with a jerking motion. I had the sensation of chains wrapped around my wrists and ankles, suspending me above something. I could feel heat, but not like any heat I had ever felt before. I felt it coming at me like waves of heat you see coming off the road ahead on a hot day. The chains, heavy and dense, jangled loudly whenever I tried to move. The blackness around me seemed alive, moving like something from a horror movie. I could hear slithering, but could see nothing. The chains biting into my hands and ankles with every move. Then, the cacophony of screams below me erupted. Slow at first, then it seemed to be coming at me from every angle. Men, women, children, and something animal and very angry. This wailing filled my head and I begged for it to stop. I hung there for days and days. The screams would ebb and then return with a vengeance. My head pounded every muscle in my naked body, screaming out for relief. The darkness all around gave me the most horrific sense of isolation. Even surrounded by voices and screams, I felt so alone, so cold inside while sweating and burning on the outside. Then the slithering sounds began again and I could sense something striking at me, like long claws. They would often miss, and I could feel the rush of air from unseen claws, then spasms of pain as they would find their target. Then joyous, dark laughter would bellow from below me. I was going insane. I would cry out but make no sound. I struggled against the chains that would not give. This went on without mercy for weeks. My mind was dissolving into madness. I had a life review, if you can call it that. As I lay there, suspended and aching, I kept trying to rationalize what was happening to me. But the more I did, the more fruitless it seemed. Was this hell? Was I dead? Was this really hell? An actual hell? I tried to remember any stupid prayer from childhood, but couldn't. Instead, I would just remember every hateful thing, every nasty word I spoke, and every person I ever lashed out at. I would feel their sadness, all of it from all of them, all at once. It was devastating. Then I felt the blows to my chest, and what I could only describe as lightning strikes appearing before my eyes. With every brilliant stroke of light, I could see the faces that surrounded me, locked in horror, mouths agape, screaming, eyes gone or dark and sinister, staring at me with such hate and contempt. The wailing of the voices was everywhere again. Flash! Flash, flash! The lights would streak around the room, lighting up more horrors with every flash, flash, flash. I felt the claws swiping at me, the growls from below sounding more angered than ever before. I would feel my flesh tear, and my mind screamed in agony as the lights would flash, and the pounding from inside my chest grew more intense. I hung my head and stopped resisting the bonds of the chains, and in my head I cried out, I'm sorry, 
So sorry. Please, God, let this end. Then there was silence. There was nothing. Then, as fast as I had fallen, I began to feel myself flying at an inconceivable speed upwards. The cries below began, but sounded hollow and millions of miles away. I realized the chains were gone from my ankles and wrists, and the lightning started again, but I couldn't see anything. Just sharp white light that hurt my eyes, and the electric crackle sound it left ringing in my ears. Then, there was a face before me, the last flash of white light, and I could see someone or something standing before me. That's when I heard a gentle voice say, It's not too late. And all went black. I could feel my body, I could hear background noises, filtering in. I could hear voices calling my name, begging me to come back. Then I heard the words, clear, and my body jumped as something hit my chest and filled me with electricity. My eyes sprang open and the pain came crashing through. I was laying in my yard surrounded by neighbors and police and EMTs feverishly working on me. I looked up and I saw the face of the portly little EMT working so hard to bring me back. He leaned down and said, I thought I lost you. Glad you didn't give up. You were gone for about three to five minutes there before we started working on you. What? Three to five minutes? How is that possible? I languished for what I knew was weeks on end, being tormented, screamed at, and torn to pieces slowly. Eternity means something more to me now, I'll tell you that. I lived the pain of everyone I ever hurt. It felt like forever. Now, sometimes at night when I lay there unable to sleep, I can hear the screams of torment. I can feel the claws trying to grab me, but I always come back to the soft voice that said, It's not too late. God, I hope not. I'm Rob Cisternino, the aptly named Rob Has a Podcast, where we're creating fun, smart conversation around reality TV games like Survivor. And this March, Survivor Game Changers is finally here. Join me weekdays for episode recaps, player interviews, and of course, your feedback. So if you're ready for a game change in your own Survivor experience, download Rob Has a Podcast at podcastone.com on the Podcast One app or subscribe on iTunes. And we're back. This is Beyond the Darkness. And Tim, yes, I need you to come with me. Come to the light. All right. It's time to cross over, Tim. No, no, no. no I'm not ready. Is. No I'm time. Ready. It's Tim to cross over. No, no, no. It's Tim to cross over. Tim it's, doesn't, it's no, it's Tim doesn't to need to cross over. No, Tim, oh, you need no. to cross over to come to True Car. Oh. Because you're no longer in charge of your own destiny when it comes to buying cars, Tim. You've got to yield to my will. Oh. Because you need to use True Car. Well, I can do that. Yeah, see, it's simple. I was just trying to bring you over to this side, the other oh. side with me, Tim. Oh. So that when you research for your new or used vehicle that you're going to uh, buy very soon here because of the uh, the bell tolling for your current vehicle. Oh, yes. Uh, it's time to find a good way to get that done. And True Car, that's the way to do it. Why? Not just because they're our advertiser, but that does help, Tim. Oh, yeah. Because I inspect all of our advertisers to make sure that they're giving us the goods, mm-hmm. that they actually work like they're going to work. Mm-hmm. They they follow through on their promises, and oh, True yeah. Car does that, Tim. They have 3 million cars sold, 13 thousand dealers tim wow. over seven hundred thousand pre-owned vehicles available right now and i can save you one thousand dollars let me make it two thousand all right tim forget it let's go how about an average of three thousand dollars off manufacturer suggested retail price are you ready to cross over now tim uh, yeah yeah well then all you need to do is use true car next time you're going to go purchase a vehicle buddy we've been talking about this for weeks and i know that you're just uh, you've been off your hoof i've been driving you around a lot yep. you've yep. got your personal chauffeur butterworth driving you around yes. a lot yes, but butterworth. eventually um the the payday runs out and you've got to get a vehicle again that's true yeah. and there are there are 700,000 pre-owned vehicles available through true car certified dealers nation nationwide mm-hmm. and what does that mean well when you use true car tim You'll see that there are other people in our area and what they've paid for the car you're looking for. So, again, 
that takes away some of the guesswork. You don't have to be afraid, Tim, to cross over. You don't have to be afraid to use TrueCar because with this, it makes it completely easy for you. You're getting the messages from the other side. You're getting messages from 13,000 dealers, Tim, who've been certified to deliver the goods to you. So this way, when you check online and you see the price, when you get there, you know that you're getting the vehicle that they that they showed mm-hmm. at the price that was promised and at the price other people are paying for it. At. I like that. Right. And once you register, uh, you'll actually get to see their real inventory. Mm-hmm. So it's competitive pricing offered to you by true car certified dealers so that when you get there, there's none of that shell game nonsense. Oh, I hate Bam. That. You got the car you came looking for. And they might have some other ones that fit exactly what you're seeking as well. With over 3 million cars sold through true car by uh, True Car Certified Dealer Networks, you got the confidence knowing that this isn't a startup, Tim. This isn't brand new and you got to wait and let it grow. Three million cars is an awful lot of cars. Oh, yes. And this gives you the chance to go check that out. So promise me, buddy, look me in the eyes. Okay. Look into my eyes. Deeper, Tim. Deeper. Look into my eyes and promise me that the next time you're ready to buy a new or used car, mm-hmm. you use True Car. I will use True Look it up. True Car, all one word. You'll find all the information, and you'll get the confidence backed in buying a car when you're ready with True Car. Now, I also want to make a quick mention here, Tim. Now that you've crossed over with me, yes. and you're going to be back on the road soon, yeah. we're going to have to start getting out and hitting some locations. I know there's a lot of cool events popping up around the United States oh, this yeah. year oh, yeah. and around the world. Remember, I'm going to England not once, but twice. you got to yeah. be careful what you yeah. wish for, son. Remember, I've always wanted to go to England. Yeah, me I'm too. I'm going in September, and I'm going in August. And maybe if you're a good boy, Tim, and you get healthy and get back on your feet, I'll let you come with me next year when I go back to England. I'd like Or that. Scotland. Yeah. Or Romania. I'd like Or that. Australia. Yeah. Wherever we end up, Tim. Yeah. Just me and you, buddy. You are my shadow, and you can join me once Aww. you're up and healthy. Yeah. But for those of you that would like to see us domestically or around the world, you can always check darknessevents.com. We only have a few spots that remain for the England trip. Our second England trip, which will actually be before our first England trip. Do you need an abacus to figure this out, Tim? I do, yes. Our first one in September sold out. In 18 hours, we had to add a second trip. We had to go back in time to August. So August 2017, we will be doing our first wave British invasion where we'll get to go with Neil's story and investigate all these great places and see the history and hauntings of England. Hmm. Then we're going back in September, but that sold out. It's no good to anybody. So just sign up for the August one, which is already half sold out. Did wow. you follow all that? I, I believe so, yes. Yeah. We'll be at the Chicago Paracon this year. Right. We're going to be at the Michigan Paracon this year. We're going to be uh, all over. So just the best way to find it is go to darknessevents.com. And you can join me this July when I return to the Odd Fellows Asylum, the Belvoir Winery in Missouri, with Chris Fleming and Bill Chapel to investigate for two nights. There's... There's day packages, night packages, and full event packages available for you for everybody's price tag. Come on out. Have a great time with us. Check out tickets at darknessevents.com. All right. We're back. Our guest is Josie Varga. We're talking about uh, A Call from Heaven, her new book, Deathbed Visits, Angelic Visions, and Crossings to the Other Side. Now, we just heard, Josie, uh, kind of a, in my opinion, terrifying tale of one of our listeners who had a deathbed vision, visited hell, and came back. Do you get many stories where it's negative when they have these near-death experiences? I haven't heard many. I've heard some, uh, but about 19% of the stories that come in, they say are negative. The majority are positive. Um, you know, obviously, if they feel that they visited hell and came back, like that's like a near-death experience. Uh, Howard Storm is, is one of them. He had a negative experience, and I think he came back, and he's, he's some kind of priest or something. So he was totally transformed by his experience. So, yeah, it, it does happen, but the majority of the experiences are positive. When it comes to deathbed phenomena, mm-hmm. um, a lot of times it happens because they might, whoever comes for them, if they don't recognize that person, well, then a lot of times they're afraid. There's one story that I heard about a little girl that was the woman. It was an older woman, and she was in hospice care, and she kept saying that there was a little girl there waiting for her, but she didn't recognize that little girl, and was afraid because she didn't recognize the little girl. She ended up passing away. And what they found out the next day was that other family members, before they died, claimed to see the same thing, a little girl. So obviously this girl was connected to the family in some way, but the the woman did not recognize her and was fearful. So most of the time when it comes to deathbed phenomena, that's what happens. If people don't recognize who came for them, then there's an element of fear. But like I said, most of the time there is no fear. But I wanted to uh, 
bring up a couple of stories yes, and th- that I think are pretty amazing. Okay. Um, there's one story that I love. People always ask me, well, every time I write a book like this, Dave, it's like, okay, well, you know, which one do you, what story do you love the most? And I hate that question because there, there, there are so many incredible stories. I can't just pinpoint one. But I'll tell you why um, I love a few of these stories. Mm-hmm. There's a woman named Barbara Harris Whitfield. She's written several books. Uh, one of her books is The Natural Soul. She had two NDEs. And uh, I've known her for a long time now. And she told me a story about a patient of hers named John Loringer. And this man, he was in his 30s. And he ended up uh, being paralyzed, and he was completely bedridden, okay? And he fought the state of Connecticut. He wanted to be taken off life support because he was completely dependent on people for his every need. Mm -hmm. And the only thing he had was his voice, and he was beginning to lose that too. So he didn't want to live anymore. So they agreed to allow him to be taken off life support. And she said she was in the room with a bunch of other people. And one of the last things he said is through his voice box, he said, they are coming for me at five o'clock. Okay. They pulled the flag. They take him off life support at about 10 a.m. They expected this guy dying to die within two hours. But he hung on, he hung on, he hung on. And you know what? He died at exactly five o'clock. And, you know, so I, I I love that story because they expected him to die soon after they took him off life support. He did not. He hung on and he died at exactly at the time he said he was going to die. Now, where did he get that information from? You know, that's that's right. one story. Um, now, when when you hear these stories, though, and they're talking, do they say who does give them this information? Is it angelic? Is it? Is it uh, family members? Sometimes, sometimes they don't. Uh, you know, they, sometimes they don't. In this particular case, I mean, he spoke through his voice box, so he didn't, you know, he didn't speak often, obviously. So he didn't say who gave him that information. Um, but sometimes people do. People say, oh, my mother was here, or, you know, uh, there, there's an angel in the room, or whatever the, whatever the case may be. Um, there was another story, which I love, comes from a woman. Uh, she had a, a father who died of cancer. And the father called out to his mother. Now, she said, okay, you know, obviously my father would call out to his mother. So she didn't think anything of it. She was skeptical, didn't think anything of it. But all of a sudden, he says, Shanka, you have come too. And oh, you look so young. Shanka was her uncle. Shanker was her father's brother-in-law, a man he did not like, okay? Mm. A, a man he did not like. So she told me, she says, Josie, when he said that, I realized, oh, my God, you know, him calling out to his mother is, is something that's not unusual. You know, he's sick, he's dying. Of course, he probably wants his mother with him. So she thought, okay, maybe he's hallucinating. But the fact that he called out to a man he never liked when he was alive, to her was proof that it was a deathbed visit. And she went to the doctor at that point and said, you know, what's going on here? Why, you know, is he saying these things? And she said, oh, yeah, you know, he's probably just hallucinating and things like that. And she said, no, it didn't make any sense to me at all because the clarity, like he was so, you know, the clarity in his voice. She said, you could see, you could tell that my father really was seeing his mother. You could tell that my father really was seeing his brother-in-law. That, that's another favorite of mine. And, and a third one that I wanted to mention was a woman that I know in town where I, where I live. Her husband um, was homesick. He, they thought he had a cold, you know, and she called him up and she said, hey, John, you know, how you feeling? You want me to pick you up anything on the way home? And he said to her, um... Judy, uh, I'm sitting here at the dining room table, I'm writing bills, and I keep seeing dead people running around the dining room table. She's like, what? She goes, oh, Jane, stop taking that cough medicine. <laughs> She's like, you know, I, I thought to myself, Josie, my husband must be, you know, hallucinating. So she goes, I didn't think anything of it. So she goes home that day, they have dinner, uh, you know, everything is normal, they go to bed. That night, 
her husband had, she said that whenever her husband couldn't sleep, Dave, he would get up and he would drive to Dunkin' Donuts to get coffee. It was a habit of his. If he couldn't sleep, he would go get Dunkin' Donuts coffee and he would, you know, drink his coffee and go back to bed. Well, on this particular night, she wakes up to the sound of a loud thud. She runs downstairs. She finds her husband on the floor in the dining room. He was sitting on the chair in the dining room. There was two unopened uh, cups of Dunkin' Donuts coffee on the table. He, you know, had a massive heart attack and died. And that really was amazing, too, because, you know, he, he said to her, there are people around the dining room table, hmm. and I think they're dead people. And she's like, oh, come on. You know, you're right, just story. dismissing it. Right. You know, and then he ends up passing away later at the dining room table where he saw those dead entities. So, Matt, that's that's another amazing story. Had she know. had she given any idea what her husband had seen? When, were they trying to get his attention? Was it just like he was? She, you know, she said, I asked for that, you know, mm-hmm. but a lot of times, Dave, when, you know, people come to you with that, your reaction is, oh, stop it, you know, and you don't ask them for more details. Mm-hmm. And she said she didn't ask her, her husband for more details and she regrets that. You know, I've done it myself. You know, I've done it myself. I mean, uh, you know, uh, people have come up to me with some experiences in, in the family and I didn't ask for more information. And looking back, I wish I would have. But he didn't say who they were specifically. He just said, I think they're all dead people. So to me, what that tells me is maybe he didn't instantly recognize all of them. Because why would he say, I think they're all dead people? I mean, obviously you would know. Right. If, you know, if your mother is deceased, you know, okay, that's my mother. She's deceased. So I'm guessing there were probably a, a lot of people there that he did not recognize. Hmm. You know, now, and I know you I, cover you cover in the book as well. You talk about um, uh, these deathbed phenomena, angelic visions, shared death experiences. And I want to get into some of those. But talk to me about gateway or portal appearances. This is something relatively new to me. I've, I've not heard of um, at these moments. Um, gateway is basically. People uh, witness what they describe as a portal or an opening. It's almost like, um, you know, they're laying in bed and they see what they describe as a tunnel. So, you know, that's one of the things that people have noticed. Uh, actually looks like a portal. You know, when people have new depth experiences and they describe seeing a tunnel. Right. Well, it's, it's, it's kind of like that. You know, they're, they're lying in bed and they actually can see this tunnel. They can actually see what looks like an opening, you know, an, an opening to the other side. That's and when they by, see these portals, uh, are they seeing through? Are they seeing friends and relatives on the other side beckoning them in? Or are they just seeing like this vortex open up for them to go that, through? Both. Both. Uh, there are some people that do see just a vortex and there are other people that see faces within, you know, within that vortex, within that gateway, however you want to describe it. I mean, you know what's amazing about all of this? I mean, I've heard hundreds and hundreds of all kinds of experiences, and yet they are so similar, but yet they are different in a lot of ways as well. Um, Another type of experience is atmospheric changes, and that's something that happened in my own family. My uncle Tony passed away. He had um, a brain tumor, okay? And, you know, when he got to the end, Dave, he could no longer talk or speak. But he would, like, lift his finger and, and point to things. So on this particular day, my sister was there, my mother was there, his, his wife, my cousin, you know, all sitting in his room. And my uncle kept looking at a spot in the room and pointing and pointing. And so my, my cousin said to him, Dad, do you see someone? If you see something... You know, if you see someone, point. Tell us where that person is. And he pointed, indicating that there was somebody else in the room. And as soon as he said that, there was like bifold. My aunt has like bifold doors in her bedroom closet. And there's no window open or anything. But the bifold doors, Dave, opened all by themselves. And it wasn't like, uh, you know, somebody was standing near the, the doors and somehow that's how it opened. No. They just opened all by itself where, and everybody, everybody in the room saw this and were completely shocked. And he died soon after that. 
So when he was still able to speak, he would always tell me that his mother came for him, that he would always see his mother. So, you know, we're, we're hoping that it was my grandmother that was there for him. You know, talking about the portals, the one aspect, you know, I kept asking, and mom and I were involved in the paranormal and, and like this. And as she was on her deathbed leading into the last few weeks and months, I would just ask her, mom, have you seen anybody yet? And she kept telling mm-hmm. me, no, nobody yet. And and I knew she knows that freaks me out and that, you know, I'm sure she was freaked out. And I, I almost got to the point where I wanted not to ask anymore because I didn't want to make her more afraid of what was coming. And and even a couple days beforehand, I asked her, have you have you seen anyone yet, mom? Have they come for you? And she said, no. But at one point when she was sitting there, she looked up and she goes, oh, and I said, what? And she goes, oh, it's just all so clear now. And I said, what? And she said, the sky. And I looked up oh. and she's looking at the ceiling. So kind of talking about the portal. And I said, oh, uh, so you see the sky? And then it's like she snapped out of it and looked at me like, oh, you heard that. And she's like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> never mind. And then she passed away a day and a half later. But it was she saw like the ceiling vanished or whatever. She could just see beautiful blue sky. Um, so there was that mm-hmm. moment as well. Uh well, there's another story uh, like that. Uh, there was a case where this woman was with her father, and they were all in his room. Now, her sister had passed away before the father. So at one moment, you know, they were all in the room, and he said that he could see a sky, and he kept saying how beautiful the sky was, but nobody else in the room could see it. Well, he died soon after telling everybody that he could see this, and as he was taking his last breath, she heard her sister's voice, her deceased sister, and her, her deceased sister said to her, don't worry, it's beautiful here. And she said it was the most amazing thing. And I know it, exactly what she means by that. You know, what I said before, when I had my experience with my husband's friend who died on 9-11, mm-hmm. when they speak to you, they don't speak to you with words, they speak to you in your mind. And, and another thing I, I want to mention, I'm hearing impaired, Okay. I'm hearing impaired. But yet, when I have these experiences, there's no doubt of what I'm hearing because it's, because it's in my mind. It's, all, it's, it's mind-to-mind communication. So I find that um, pretty amazing. And I've, Do I they have, have had, accents in, in telepathy? Do you hear accents or dialects when you are communicating that way then? No, I, I just hear like just – it comes through kind of like a thought. You know, um, I'll give you an example. Um, there was one case where I, I was in my room and I was uh, doing laundry, folding laundry. And all of a sudden, I heard in my head, call my mom. And intuitively, I knew it was this girl, Angel. Angel was a girl that I mentioned in my book, Visits from Heaven. Okay? She passed away. And when I was writing the story, her mother said to me, my God, that story is so perfectly written. It's almost as if Angel was whispering in your ear. And I told the mother that when I was writing that particular story, I almost like felt the spirit of her daughter standing next to me. So anyway, on this particular day, when I heard call my mom, I don't know how, Dave, but I knew it was her. I knew it was this girl, Angel. So what do I do? I go downstairs. I get my file of contacts for that particular book. I find the contact information for her mother. And, I, and again, I was very nervous. I'm like, okay, you know, how's she going to react? But I called her mother up. I told her what happened. And, uh, and you know what she said to me? <laughs> she said, oh, my God. I said, what? She said, today is my birthday. So then it made perfect sense to me. I said, okay, well, I, I guess happy birthday from your daughter. But that's <laughs> an example. It was a... a, a I don't even know how to even describe it. It's just like a, a very strong thought. It was like very clear, you know, call my mom. There's another story, and that's also in my book, A Call from Heaven. I have a friend, Nancy Clark, and one year I was having some health issues, and I had a procedure done. So I, I was laid up, Dave, and I figured, okay, since I'm laid up, let me read her new book. And I get to, it was, uh, her book is called Divine Moments, and I get to the end of the book, and in the book she talks about her deceased husband, and how, uh, you know, they would celebrate the anniversary of a year, and he would buy her yellow roses, okay? She talked about how love never dies and all that. I close the book, and all of a sudden, I hear really clear in my mind, 
by Nancy Yellow Roses. And I thought to myself, by Nancy Yellow Roses, like what the heck? <laughs> okay. So, but it was, it was very, very clear. So I said to my husband, John, I just heard by Nancy Yellow Roses. I think it was her husband, Chad, telling me to buy Nancy Roses. And he said to me, well, uh, if you really think that that's what you heard, go ahead, buy her Yellow Roses. I said, all right. So I didn't have her um, snail mail address. I only had her P.O. box address. So I emailed her and I said, Nancy, I'll explain later, but can you please send me, you know, your mailing address? I need to send you something. She replied back to me, but she didn't give me her address. But you know what she said? What? She said, Josie, Saturday would have been my husband and I 50th wedding anniversary. Well, I was just, my mouth just dropped because I, I said to myself, oh, my God, that's why he wants me to send his wife yellow roses, right? So I write her back again. And I said, listen, like I said, can you please give me your um, you know, snail mail address, I'll explain later. So this time she writes back and she says, oh, okay. And she gives me her, her mail and address. And I go on and I'm looking for the perfect yellow roses for her. And I like lilies, right, Dave? So I find these flowers uh, and it had a few lilies in it. And I go to order it and it wasn't going through. I mean, the computer kept shutting down. It just, it just wasn't going through. And I said to myself, Okay, I guess these are not the roses that I'm supposed to send her. <laughs> I go on again, and I find lawn stem yellow roses. I said, okay, these look really pretty. Just just yellow roses. And I order that, no problem. Okay. So the day comes. Um, I put on the card, Nancy, these roses are not from me. They're from Ted with all his love. I said, call me, I'll explain. Meanwhile, on her end, Dave... She's praying and praying and praying and asking her husband to please bring her a sign for their anniversary. So it's close to five o'clock. The flowers haven't been delivered yet. She's thinking, okay, I guess he's not going to bring me my sign. She opens the door and there were the yellow roses. Now, to me, that was pretty amazing. And, and what would have happened if I didn't follow through on you know, on that thought that came to my mind. But that's what I mean. It's it's like a thought. I don't, I really wouldn't say, you, you know, I mean, some people do hear it. Right. It's like if, if I came to you and I sat next to you and I was talking to you, some people do hear it that way. But when I have it, I, it's, it's usually in my mind. It comes to me like a thought. That's the best way I can describe it. And that, that story is in A Call From Heaven uh, I think that's one of the most amazing things because very often those on the other side elicit the help of others to bring a message through. And that was a very, very powerful message for his wife, obviously. Obviously. Wow, that is <laughs> that is definitely impactful. Now, deathbed visits, when you talk about shared death experiences, mm -hmm. um, and I know we've only got a few minutes left together, can, kind of bring our, our listeners up to date on what a shared deathbed visitation means. A shared death visit is when uh, someone else participates in the experience. Um, there's a woman by the name of Annie Cap in the UK. Um, her mother was in the US and she was in the UK. And at the moment that her mother was on her deathbed dying, her daughter experienced many of the symptoms that her mother was going through thousands of miles away. And she couldn't understand what was happening. I mean, she was, you know, gagging. Uh, it, it felt like something was stuck in her throat. And she said she, she was with a client at the time and she had to excuse herself and end the session. And she said she had this overwhelming feeling that she needed to call her sister who was with her mom at the hospital back in the United States, okay? When she finally got to the phone mm -hmm. and her sister she could hear her mother in the background, and she realized at that point, Dave, that she was actually experiencing a lot of the same things that her mother was experiencing. So a shared death experience is getting to do just that, to share somebody's deathbed experience. And it doesn't have to be negative. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in Annie Capp's case, she had some of the physical – she took on some of the physical symptoms that her mother was experiencing but um you know there are other people who 
maybe have a dream at the same time, you know, who witnessed the, the, the phenomena. There's a, a woman named Jenny Taylor Martin who had a dream. You know, she saw her mother in her dream and she was saying goodbye to her mother in her dream, saying, I love you, mom, and saying goodbye to her mother in her dream. And she said at that moment, she was awoken by the phone. It was the hospital calling, telling her that her mother had just passed away. Mm-hmm. So, you know, share deaf experiences, people who actually get to share in the experience in some way. Um, in any Kafka's case, she got the physical symptoms, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. It could mean that they come to you in a dream, uh, you know, at the moment that they die. Uh, you know, one guy had an out-of-body experience where he actually saw the body of someone else being lifted from his, you know, bed. So it doesn't have to be a negative experience. There's all different kinds of shared death experiences. A call from heaven, deathbed visits, angelic visions, and crossings to the other side. It's the new book by Josie Varga. And if you'd like to get a copy of that book, um, make sure that you go visit uh, podcastone.com. Click on the Killer Deals link, and then you'll find the Beyond the Darkness banner. Click on that, and it'll take you into the special program we have with Amazon.com. So wherever you're listening from, the UK, Canada, or the United States, click on the corresponding banner. And whatever books, videos, clothes, furniture, anything you order... By using those links, a small percentage goes a long way to help your pals here pay all of the administrative costs to keep the show on the air. And it costs you no extra and the people selling their items don't lose a penny. It all goes right from the top and goes to help us out. So make sure that when you purchase this book and you should purchase this book, a little portion will go a long way to help keep this show afloat. Josie, thank you so much for coming on to share your stories with us this evening. Uh, Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. It has been a real pleasure chatting with you and spending some time. So thank you for being a part of it. We'll be back with you guys again next week. Again, on Monday, we've got Parish Air and Supernatural News. And Tuesday, the return of True Crime Tuesday, Possession, the Stiletto Murders. We'll talk about that. That's right. A paranormal true crime on True Crime Tuesday for you. So I want to thank everybody, especially our advertisers for the week. We've got Harry's.com, Harry's Razors. We've got uh, True Car, Amazon.com. Um, and remember, if you need your fix over the weekend, you want to continue to listen to great and strange, fascinating stories and subjects, check out our buddies at Coast to Coast AM. That's Coast to Coast AM with George Nori. Tonight, George's guest is a professionally trained psychic and medium, Christian Von Lahr, who will discuss his ongoing work exploring direct communication with the nature people, as well as other realms of consciousness, including ghosts and angels, and how we can tap into other dimensions and energies to enhance our decision-making and intelligence, followed by two hours of open lines in the latter half of tonight's show. And I'll be back hosting it on March 25th. And again, back April 8th. You can keep up with when I'm going to be hosting and what the topics are every night by visiting coasttocoastam.com. And if you check it out, become a Coast Insider. Sign up for a one-year subscription, less than 15 cents a day, and it gets you access to five years of past shows. I've been hosting it for four years now. So that means you can hear every show I've been a guest of and been a part of hosting on Coast to Coast AM. Plus, you get thousands of other hours. Hours of the best in overnight talk radio. So thank you and check that out for yourself. Coast to coast.